Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the fourth and final sessions of the multidimensional MoGraph. What a what a nice title you picked there, Jonas. And um, in today's sessions, we'll see um, Jonas explain us. Um, will take us um, through Cinema 4D and Redshift. Is that right? He will well, actually show it's, it's Cinema 4D and MoGraph. So today we're not going to have any Redshift included, but uh... because because Lionel no, 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 no. was already covering that. Okay, that's cool. So um, today's sessions, Jonas will explain us uh, some Cinema 4D and MoGraph uh, cool tricks, and he will uh, show things um, in, a, in, a, in a Cinema 4D. And I think I heard that Jonas in the mood of building something today. Isn't that right, buddy? Yeah, that's uh, a great pun, by the way, because I'm creating, <laughs> I'm gonna build buildings or, yeah. uh, the rig for one building and then you can like just create multiple buildings out of these sounds like really fun by the way and um yeah so well apart from that if you want to know about something more fun today you know that today you can actually get a free t-shirt and um if you want a free t-shirt from ask the trainer and simply you can go to the handout sections from the webinar panel and um, there you will see the PDF sections and there is a link um, that you can follow that will bring you to the shop um, interface. And that should be the Maxon as the trainer exclusive wear. And um, the, some, I, I heard that some people has a um, um, problem with the code. Um, the, the workflow is that you know once you access the link, you will need to put the code right in front of the, um, before entering the page. And then after that, you can select one of this T-shirt and then it's supposed to be uh, zero in price. And you just need to pay for the shipping cost, which is around about $4. Uh, dollar. But to enter the site, you have to put the, the code as a password. And um, if you still have problem with, um, with the password, please let me know, let us know, and simply write us to um, training at maxon.net. And then apart from that, another good news, another fun news is that if you want to take your Cinema 4D game further and you want to learn more, because I bet you want to, and um, our very own master trainer, Lionel Ficidomini, is also providing a great discount up to 80% on his Cinema 4D courses at Udemy. And um, same as before, you can use the link provided in the PDF um, handout, and it will take you to the website. And thank you for providing the discount, Lionel. That's very kind of you. Of course, thank you. And another thing is that um, if you miss the last webinar and or you want to uh, you want to check the other webinar that hosted by Maxon Training Team you know that you can simply go to YouTube and search for our channel. It's called Maxon Training Team. All the webinar hosted by the Maxon Training Team will be hosted there, will be uploaded after the live sessions has ended, and it will be in the Maxon Training Team YouTube channel. And not to mention, not, not to forgot to mention that you can also do uh, certifications. If you want to, to do an elementary knowledge test to test your Cinema 4D knowledge, you can simply go to maxon.net slash certifications or if you want to take a basic comprehensive certifications you can also do that from there and another great news is that next week uh, yeah next week next month uh, we'll have another set of webinar and Lionel will be coming back and joining us in this webinar and we'll talk more about color in Cinema 4D in Redshift and also in the DI in Resolve. And then also at the end, we'll be joined by um, Diego Yama, and he will talk about monitoring colors with a professional equipment. That's the session for next week. So save the date. And without further ado, let me hand out the microphone to Jonas, because I'm sure he can't wait to deliver the procedural buildings, the tricks to build yeah. the procedural buildings. Jonas, yeah, there's, the stage there's is quite... yours, please, buddy. Yeah, thank you. I'm gonna I'm gonna grab the screen from you, and um, let's uh, see which one it is. Here we go. 
broadcast. Now you should see my screen and yeah. we already have some buildings on there. And the cool thing about these buildings is that they are procedural. This is something that I've seen a lot like in social media and so on. And people were asking how to do this in Cinema 4D. But um, yeah, like give me just this, uh, let me show you a small example. So if you have a look at this small house here, you can um, simply adjust the count of segments uh, for like all directions and the house will automatically adjust. And this is the same with all of the other buildings as well. And I want to show you how you can create a rig like that. So this is going to be exciting. It's also uh, going to be a little bit technical because we're going to use a little bit of Espresso and um, some of the new capsules in Cinema 4D R25 that we're going to use to create procedural selections in order to clone these elements that you just see on screen right now um, onto like basically just a cube. So here we go. These are the elements that um, I modeled for um, this one small building and as you can see they are well these are the ones for the ground floor these here are the ones for um, all of the other floors where we can have many and these ones here are the ones for the roof so and another thing that I want to show you here if I select all of them you can see where the pivot is where yeah the axis is so let me go to front view. You can see that in X, Y direction, all of these axes are in the middle. All of these um, elements also come with the same height and the height is one meter in, in this case. It can be two meters, it can be three meters, but I modeled everything in one meter. Um, and also one meter width for the um, wall elements. And um, yeah, um, if you go to the top view, you can also see that the corners are a little bit different. Let me just zoom in to this corner. So here's the corner and it's going until here. And you can see that the axis is right at the end of these, um, of these walls. So um, it's also good to know what the distance is in this case, it's 20 centimeters. We're going to use that later. Yeah, and that's basically the, the rules for modeling this stuff. Another thing, um, because in the MoGraph context, if you want something, well, if something is cloned on an object and you want it to be um, aligned the right way, the outside has to be the plus Z or Z axis. That's also important. And yeah, with this knowledge, we are going to start um, to create the rig. And what I want to do is, uh, first of all, I'm going to create a null and uh, call this wall L element and throw everything in here so we can fold it away and also hide it. Cool. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a cube because everything here is going to be based on a cube and i want to show you something i'm gonna make all of the segments two by two by two and i'm going to display um, guru shading with lines and here you can see that we've got these lines here and now if we have two segments and 200 centimeters this means that every one of these every single one of these squares is 100 by 100 centimeters and this is important and this is also what we want to enforce so the first thing i'm going to do is um like after i set the ground plane to be like really the ground plane for this um for this cube i'm going to create a small espresso setup that is linking the segments and the size here so let me start uh, with procedurally keeping the um the axis of the cube at the bottom of the cube and this can be done by using the new capsules so well the capsules are not new but it's new that you can use them in the object manager inside of cinema 4d so what i'm going to do is i'm going to open up the asset browser and in here i want to go to the operator section 
And there are two important categories that we are going to use. One is the geometry modifiers, and the other one is geometry selections. And you can think of these um, assets here as yeah, node-based assets that can now be used here in the object manager. And these have been created using the CNode system. So the first thing I'm going to do to keep a better overview here is I'm gonna switch to list view, and then I'm gonna scale it down so I just have this list here. This helps a lot. All right, and now in the geometry modifiers, there is one um, capsule that I like very much, which is the geometry axis capsule. And I'm just going to drag and drop it from here onto the cube. And you can see that it's now a child of that cube. And we can now adjust the axis. And if we bring it up to 100%, you can see that the cube is always um, like standing on the ground. And that's perfect. That's what we want. And now if I just select the cube and I scale it, oops, that was the segments. But if I scale it up and down, you can see that it's always standing on the floor, no matter, uh, no matter what. All right, now let's connect these two together because actually I rather want to um, adjust the segments here. Let's say I put it to four and then the size Y has to adjust to 400 centimeters. So I get square polygons here because I told you earlier, this is important for the setup. All right, well, how can we do that? Well, I'm gonna create a null and I'm, call, I'm gonna call this uh, procedural building. This is gonna be our overall group for everything where we, um, yeah, we throw everything inside of this null. And then I'm gonna create two tags. The first one is under programming tags and it's an espresso tag. This is this can be used to create um, connections between controls and parameters of various objects. So I'm going to create the Expresso tag and then I'm also going to create another programming tag which is the user data tag. Well actually you can create user data on any tag or object but the user data tag is is there um, so that you know um, that it's that is holding user data. It's only purpose is to hold, yeah, to carry user data. So let me um, rename this to house controls, hit enter, and you can see there is nothing more than than uh, like yeah these parameters. And now I'm going to go to user data, and I'm gonna add some user data. So what I want to add first is a parameter that is going to be going to be called segments x. All right, and this segments x um, is supposed to have a data type, which is integer. Integers are numbers without any decimals. And this is what we need because we have a count of segments and this count cannot be 1.5 or 1.7 or so. It has to be full numbers. So here we go. We set it to integer and we are also going to set the, inter uh, the interface to integer slider. So now we get a slider. And then um, I'm going to set the minimum to one and the maximum can be 100. And I'm also gonna set a slider min and a slider max. And the slider min is supposed to be one and slider max, let's say, let's go with 10. And the default is gonna be two. Cool, now let's hit okay. This is our segments X. Well, actually hitting OK was a bad idea. Let's go to user data, manage user data again, and let's just create a few copies of this one. So let me control click and drag this parameter and let's rename it to segments Y. And then let's create another copy of this one by control clicking and dragging. And let's call this segments Z or Z, depending on where you are. All right, now that we have these three parameters, we can hit OK. And now you can see we have three parameters in here. Great, now let's connect them. So just a warning, we are going to work on a cube 
um, for quite a while now. And it's not going to be very beautiful um, for the next, let's say, 30 minutes. But then after that, if we are like once we are in the stage where we can add all of those uh, wall elements and so on, it's going to be very pretty uh, within just a few minutes. So let's continue creating that rig. And the first thing I want to do is I want to drag and drop this user data tag into my Expresso window. And then I'm going to drag and drop the parameters here directly onto the output side of my house controls user data node. Um, by control double clicking, you can um, yeah, set the size of a node, of an Expresso node, so that it's showing everything. And then I'm going to drag and drop the cube in here as well. And let's have a look at the parameters. We need segments X, segments Y, segments C, size X, size Y, and size Z. Again, control double click. And now we have this. That's great. Now, what we can do already is we can just link up the segments, just like so, just create a direct connection. And then the second thing I want to do is I want to multiply the count of the segments by 100 so that we can have, like here, uh, if we have two by two by two, then we have 200 by 200 by 200 in the end. All right, so let's right click here. And now we can search for that node. I know that the node that I'm searching is called math node. So I'm going to start typing math and this will filter the menus here. So I can, without searching all of these sub menus, I can just go there, use the math node, create it. And now I'm going to set its function to multiply and set input two to 100. And now I can simply um, connect segments X to input one and the output to size X. And then again, by control, um, clicking and dragging, I'm gonna create a copy and do the very same thing for Y. And I'm gonna create another copy and do the very same thing for Z. All right, so that's not too bad. Let me close the Expresso editor and let's have a look at what we just created. So I'm going to click um, the user data tag. And now if we adjust the segments here, you can see that it's working perfectly. That's great. I'm also going to save this incrementally. So let me go to save incremental. Here we go. And now let's um, create the first selections also using using um, capsules in the object manager. So let me bring this up a little bit more. So as I, um, as I mentioned earlier, you can use those node-based assets here in the object manager to create or to add procedural functionality. And well, it is as easy as just dragging and dropping stuff in here. So let me create the first selection that I want to create. And this is going to be a select facing node. Facing node. Let me just add it and then I'm going to explain it to you. By using the select facing node, we can select one side and it will select polygons on this side with a tolerance. So we cannot see that right now because um, we have to add another, like, yeah, another modification to the geometry in order to see this. And what I want to do is um, I want to go to the geometry modifiers and just create an inset. Now let me create this and let me put this um, right under the select facing. And now you can already see that we created an inset, but just on these polygons here on the top. If I switch this to X or um, Z, you can see that we can move the selection around because it's um, it's procedural and whatever we are going to use here will be um, will be updated. 
Cool. Now let's go to the inset. And in the inset, there is one very important thing. Um, and you can find this in all of the, or in most of the geometry modifiers and also in some of the selection modifiers. And it's this selection string um, parameter, which is set to default. And default means that this inset is now performed on the active selection. And if there is no active selection, it will be performed on everything. Now, like if I um, just um, place this select facing like beneath the inset, then everything is selected because this is executed from top to bottom. And um, right now there is no active selection for the inset, so it will select everything. If I place the select facing first, this is going to be the active selection and the insert will take it. All right. So what we need to do from here, what I want to do is I want to select just this top row, but without the top. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to procedurally store this selection. And this can be done by using the store selection um, asset here just drag and drop it right under the select facing and now it's set to polygon as a type and i'm gonna give it a name let's name it top and now you can see that a selection tag has been created and the name of it is top and that's important because we can refer to that later right now that this is selected i'm gonna grow this selection so let's grow the selection using this one and just place the grow beneath it and now you can see that it grew by one cool and now the next step that i want to do is i want to use this selection and subtract this selection from it and this is this is the one that we saved earlier so what i can do now is i can use a select node and place it here and in here i'm going to use the selection string um, default like so we can now also use active that would give us the same thing active would give us the same uh, selection and then we can subtract the top here but if i just type in top nothing will happen because if we are referring to a selection name like this one here we have to we have to put that here in quotes and as soon as i do that you can see that the top selection has been subtracted from this ring which is uh, awesome and now we can store that selection so let me store this selection and this is going to be our roof so here we're going to place our roof elements that I showed you earlier. And the selection string, we have to define that, that's important, is going to be either default or active, it doesn't matter. I'm going to use default. Here we go. And now this is stored using the name roof. Cool. Now, as you can already see, there is all of these are coming with the same icon. So the distinct... Uh, uh, you, you can not really distinguish between those. So what I prefer to do is, first of all, I'm going to add the name here in quotes so that I know that this is going to create my roof selection. And here in the very beginning, I'm going to add three dashes so that I know that this one is somehow special. All right, so that's cool. Now we created our first row here. And now I'm going to create the row for the ground floor elements. Cool. How am I going to do that? Basically, the very same way as I created this row, but the opposite way. So I'm going to select all of these and I'm going to create a copy and deactivate them. And now we're going to go from top to bottom to see what we are doing. All right. First of all, I want to select facing. And, well, it's obviously the wrong direction. I want to select minus Y. Now it's the bottom here. That's great. So let me store this selection, but I want to call the selection bottom. And let me also make this active. 
and I think I forgot it here as well. So let's set this to active as well. It's it's uh, quite important that you don't forget that because sometimes it will break the setup otherwise. So now I start it. So we can activate this. Then I'm going to grow the selection. Here we are. And then I'm going to select the active selection minus bottom. And once I activate it, you can see that now we just selected the bottom row. Cool. And now let's save this to um, the store selection thing, to this selection. And this is going to be our um, ground floor row. I'm just going to call it ground floor. And also I rename this one to ground floor so that I know what the name of this one is and activate it. So now we have this setup. We already have two selections, one for this one down here and one for this one up here. We can also already check if these selections are working by going to the inset. And here we can also refer to the selections that we created. And um, if I now type in uh, roof in quotes here, you can see that our top row is selected. And if I use ground floor here, and the reason why I'm writing this in quotes here already is that I ju then just can uh, go here and paste it. So here we go. So we can refer to these selections. I'm going to set it back to default for now because I want to create the next selection. Cool. The next selection is going to be the selection of all of the floors here. So we have one, two, three floors. So how can we get that? Basically, we can create a selection of the Y facing um, sides here, then grow them by one, then invert the selection, and then we have it. So let's try this. All right, let me um, go to select facing and add this well it has to be added down here and then we set it to y and right now you can see it's just the top that is selected but we can check and opposite and now we have them both selected that's great let's grow the selection like so perfect and now let's use a new um, capsule the invert selection and there we go that's it already. Great. Now we can store the selection here. And we're going to use another store selection and just rename it to floors. And we're going to use the active selection for that. Great. Now let me again add this to here active just for the sake of keeping the overview. And here we go. Now we've got these three selections already. All of them are polygon selections, and that's great. Now you can already see that if we are creating, well, like many of these, we can really populate our viewport a lot. And one way to, to make everything a little bit better to keep the overview is to select everything that we don't want to see later. And I want to select everything except for our store selections here that we created to um, create the final um, uh, polygon selections. And then I'm going to right click and add all of this to a new layer. So now you can see that um, all of these capsules have been uh, added to this layer. So let me go to the layers. I'm going to rename this layer to hide hit enter, and then if you click this button, you can hide them from the object manager. And this is something that is quite cool. All right. Well, the next thing I want to do is um, I want to adjust the icon of this guy here so we can see that this, is, this has nothing to do with selections. So let me go to the basic um, tab and under icon settings, I'm going to load a preset. I'm just going to use this one here and double click it and this will create this icon for us 
And then we can also um, disable it. Who knows if we need it later? So let's keep it in here. Great. So the next thing we know uh, we knew, the next thing we need is um, edge selections for the corners. So we need a selection for the corners of the top row. We need a selection for the corners of this bottom row. And we need a selection for all of the rows in between. How can we do that? Well, it all starts again with the select facing. So let's create the select facing. And let me also, from the geometry modifier, so we can visualize our selection, let me add a chamfer. So we're going to add the chamfer. And again, for the sake of keeping the overview, I'm going to load the very same preset here again. So we know that this is a geometry modifier and has nothing, nothing to do with the selections. All right, so we selected the facing. And in the chamfer, actually, I need to go to the inputs um, tab and choose edges as the type instead of points. And now you can see that we selected all of the edges. But this is because use angle is checked here. And this can confuse us. So we are going to switch that off because we want to see our selections. So now it's going to select and uh, chamfer everything from the default selection. Remember, the default selection is either the active selection or if there is no active selection available, it will use all edges in this case. And this is what happens right now. Cool. So. This means that the select facing is not working with edges. So we need to convert it from a polygon selection to an edge selection. And this can be done under like geometry selection, transfer selection. This is what we need here. So let me create a transfer selection. And let me convert this from a polygon selection to an edge selection. Here we go. And now you can see that we can't see anything anymore because we forgot to adjust the orientation to Y plus. So now you can see it's working. Great. So the next thing we need to do is, well, actually like creating a, a selection for this again. So let me do this. I'm going to uh, store the selection. And now we need to take care of the type because this is not polygons anymore, but edges. So we're going to uh, create an edge selection. We're going to um, rename it uh, top edges and use the active selection. All right. So this has been stored. Now we want to grow it. So let's grow the selection and let's adjust the type to be edges. So now it's been grown. And the next thing I want to do is I want to select it. And the reason I want to select it is because again, I get this selection string field here. Let me switch this to edges. And now we can subtract the active selection again from our top edges selection. So let's do this. Active minus, and then in quotes, remember, uh, top edges. And again, quotes. So now we have this. This is actually quite OK. But what we need is not this selection but we only need the corners. So how can we get those? Well, here's one thing that you can do. There is a node or a, an, an asset that is called edge break. And if we add this, you can see that um, we can define an angle when we want to create an edge break. And we also have a selection output um, tab here. And this means we can already define a selection name. So let me rename this to all breaks. 
Perfect. And now you see that there is a new edge break um, selection. All breaks is the name. Cool. So we need to refer to that here in the select. So it has to be created earlier. And I want to create this one directly um, after I created the polygon selection. So I'm going to move it up. So this has been this will be created first and then I'm going to select the facing and so on and so that I end up with this row. And now here in the store selection, um, no, in the select, we need to find a way to create a selection of the intersection of the two from the edge break, which is selecting all of the edges, and this one that is a selection of the top row edges. And you can use the plus and minus um, operators in here, but you can also use the logical operators, which means you can use this and here. And this will have a look if um, selections are, or if edges in this case, are part of the same selection. So if I type in all uh, breaks here, which is the name of this selection, it will have a look um on on this selection here and then compare it with the second selection and if there are edges that are contained in both selections these are going to form the new selection so this is an intersection selection what a great word intersection selection all right so if i do that you can see that we get exactly what we want we're just selecting the corners of the top row. That's brilliant. And I want to store this selection. Also in the store selection, we have to make sure that we are going to set this to edges. And then I'm going to name this roof corners. And I'm going to use the active selection. Great. So let me also to keep the, the overview let me rename this so that we have the same naming conventions as upstairs like so and now we can see what we did perfect great as earlier we are just going to create a copy of this whole thing and create the um the edge breaks for uh, the the edge selection the corner selection for the bottom row. So I'm going to create a copy of everything by holding down um, control and dragging it. And I'm going to deactivate these again. So again, let me just activate the first two. And here in the select facing, I'm going to set this to minus y. So this will select the bottom row here. Then the transfer selection is already um, activated. So we are going to um, convert from polygon to edge and then i'm going to store this selection into a selection that is called bottom edges that's great all right let me activate this then we're going to grow the selection again and then here in the select we are going to use the active selection subtract the bottom edges from it and then create the intersection with the all breaks that uh, that we created all right let me do this perfect it's working and now we're going to store this to a selection called ground lore corners we're going to use the active selection again and use that name here as well Perfect. Let's activate it so we have that selection. Cool. Now, let me continue. Now we need the corners of those, um, yeah, of those uh, floors here in the middle. And how can we get these? Let me create a select first. Because in the select, we can refer to any other selection. And we already created a polygon selection for these three rows here, or for all rows that are not the top row and not the bottom row. 
So this selection was called, well, it wasn't called active. It wasn't called, it was called lores. See, from time to time, you really have to, to tidy up this. Otherwise you, uh, you get crazy. So here we go. We need to select the floors. Floors in quotes. There we go. And it's correct that we're going to select those as polygons. And then we're going to convert this or transfer this selection to or from polygons to edges. And now you can see that we already selected this. We already made all of the work to, to create the floor selection for polygons. So why should we recreate it from scratch here? There's no reason to do that. Cool. And now that we have this, we again need to create another selection that is the intersection of all edges and this one. So let me create a select here. And we are going to set the type to edges and we're going to use the active selection and subtract um, our all breaks. So let's open the quotes, all breaks and just click outside. And here we go. That's wrong because I subtracted it. What I actually would have needed to do is to use that logical end. This is what we actually need. So here we go. And well, this is this is really nice. So let me let me store this selection. Here we go. And let's rename this. Well, first of all, let's define the type, which is supposed to be edges. And then let's rename this to floors, core, nares, and use the active selection to create that selection. And we're going to copy this out, paste it in here so we know what we're doing, and use the same naming convention. And now it should work. Now let's try this here in the chamfer. Again, we can use all of these strings um, of the stuff that we just created. So let me use the roof corners in quotes and go to chamfer just paste it in here and let's see if it works that's working then we're going to use the ground floor corners and have a look at them that's also working perfect and the floors corners which is also working perfect so now we can reset this to default and yeah, just tidy up a little bit. So again, let me select all of those modifiers here that I want to, that I want to hide and then right click and add to layer hide. Here we go. Now we have a pretty tidy um, manager here, object manager. And we can also switch this one off. So as you can see, this is exactly what I meant. We are still having the cube here, but now we also have procedural selections that will work no matter how we um, adjust the dimensions here. So let me let me show this to you. If I have these corners here selected, I can now still like make the building bigger or smaller or wider and so on. And it will always select these corners. So that's perfect. Great. Now let me deactivate this. And now we are finally going to add those wall elements to this. Are there any questions so far? About the node, I'm looking at the question here. Mm -hmm. And no, nothing, nothing yet. Yeah, actually, okay. yes, there was one question. Um, yeah. It would be more easy if you use a kind of node system. This is the node, but you can answer uh, better than me, I think, uh, Jonas. Yeah, well, sure. 
Um, but the the reason why we added this functionality that you can add those node-based assets to the object manager is that many people are using the object manager. So this is the way how you can create procedural selections inside of the object manager, and then you can refer to them in MoGraph. And this is exactly what I want to do next. So the strength here is um, that you can use those um, capsules here for procedural modeling. And yeah, that's that's exactly what I intend to do here. And yeah, you're going to be excited. Yeah. I promise. <laughs> I am already. Cool. So we're just seeing a subdivided cube. It's not very beautiful, but it has all of these selections in it. And this is a big deal because from now on, everything will go really fast. So the first thing I want to do is I create a cloner. And I want to add my floor or my ground floor um, wall objects to this cloner. So it's the shop windows and the door. And I'm going to add them here in the cloner. And you can see that um, the cloner is working. And now I'm going to set up the cloner. So first of all, I want to clone onto an object. And this object is supposed to be that cube here. So in the cube, let me switch this back to instance. In this cube, we are going to use polygon center as the distribution type. So now this is already looking quite good. It's flickering because we still have the, the other cube um, visible. And then we're going to restrict it to this selection here. And that's our ground floor polygon selection, this one. So let me drag and drop this in here. And ta-da, here we go. We can now also um, yeah, make the cube invisible. And now you can see that it's working. We can also um, adjust like these parameters here and you can see that uh, it's working quite well. Cool. So this is our ground floor. Perfect. Now let's make this a child of our procedural building null as well. And let's add the another, um, another one. We are going to add the the floors next. So let me create a copy of this. We're going to rename this to floor. And in here, we're going to delete these two objects and we're going to use window and window open and just throw it into this cloner. And then we're going to set up this cloner so that the selection is not ground floor anymore, but floors. So let's do this and ta-da, the next one is happening. So again, let's double check if it's working. That's looking amazing. Perfect. And now everything that's left is this um, like roof row, the top row. So let me create another copy here and rename this to roof. And I'm going to throw in this and delete the other two. And I'm also going to adjust the selection here to roof. And here we go. So this is looking quite good. Let's play around a little bit. Yeah, that's looking good. Perfect. All right. So we are pretty far already. And um, well, after setting up all of these procedural selections, coming to this point here was pretty fast. All right, but we don't have the corners in here. So usually if you have um, an object with a silhouette that is a perfect cube, you can go with this setup already. You wouldn't have to create all of these um, edge selections in addition, but here you can see we have elements that are like pushed outwards here a little bit. And there is a gap here, of course. And the same thing 
happens up here. And um, also, usually, if you have a building, those windows wouldn't be so close to the corner. So instead, the distance between a window and the corner would at least be the distance from one window to the next. And this is why we have those uh, corner elements, not just to create a corner, but also to increase the distance here a little bit. So let me start with the ground floor corners. I'm going to create another copy and rename it to ground floor corners. Here we go. Let's throw out these elements here. And now let's set it up. We want to clone onto an object. This object is supposed to be the cube. That's correct. And we're going to adjust the distribution from polygon center to edge. And now we're going to use the ground floor corners in here. You can't see anything because I haven't assigned it to the cloner. So let's drag and drop this in here. And here we go. So this is looking, well, interesting. Let's put it this way. So what's happening here? With the wall elements, it was easy because I adjusted the axis so that um, Z or Z was pointing outwards. Here, the thing is that the normal or the edge is pointing outwards in like a 45 degree angle here. So let me try the following. In the, in the cloner, in the transform section, let's have a look, which, which angle is it? This one, it is. So let's type in 45. That's looking already um, a little bit better, and uh, but it's not enough. Actually, it's 45 plus um, 90, which equals 135. So here we go. Now our corners are correct. So here we go. They just have this offset. But I know um, I mentioned this earlier that um, that the pivot of every corner is right here where these two walls would meet here. So it's here, but on 50 centimeters, like in the middle when it comes um, um, to the Y. Um, yeah. And then I'm going to create a copy of this one. And wait, this is floors, not floor. And the next one is floors corner floors, corner, corners, and we're going to throw out the ground floor corner and instead use the floors corner. Here we go. In this case, we need to adjust the selection again from ground floor corners to floors corners. So this is going to be our selection that we need. And here we go. That's looking pretty good again with that offset, but we are going to take care of the offset later. And the next one, the last one is the roof corners. So let's rename this to roof corners. And we're going to um, delete this object and instead use the roof corner. So, here we go. Now, this is a little bit different. Maybe the axis is not correct. So it's pointing inwards here. That's not what is supposed to happen. Um, well, first of all, let's fix this. And let's just add 180 to this. And now it's looking better. That's how it's supposed to be. And we're also going to restrict these elements to the roof corners selection, which is this one. So here we go. That's looking great, except for this side. And if we have a look at this side, it's a little bit strange, but everything is upside down here. And this is something to do with, um, with the, the way the geometry is built, because suddenly um, like the edges are pointing from top to bottom instead from bottom to top. But we can fix this with a simple uh, MoGraph setup. Well, we don't need this here anymore. 
So let's get rid of it. And I want to create an effector for all of these corners, these corners, um, cloners. And this is going to be just a plain effector. And this is my uh, upside down fix. And the only thing that I'm going to do in here is under parameter, I'm going to switch off position and I'm going to adjust the scale in Y direction. So because this is relative scale, uh, you probably know that minus one is scaling it down to like very flat. So if we want this to be inverted, we have to go minus two. Here we go. And now you can see that this one is correct, but the other ones are upside down. So the way to fix that is to uh, restrict the effect of this effector by using a field. And we're going to use a box field for that. So let me create a box field. Here we go. Here's my box field. And first of all, let me adjust the size to 100,000 by 100,000 by 100,000. And I'm also going to go to the remapping tab and adjust the inner offset to be 100%. And then we have to move it to the side so that the corner of the effector is exactly here um, in the scene origin. So let me go to the coordinates and in position X, I'm going to type in minus 100,000 and in Z also minus 100,000. And here we go. Now it's here and you can see that this side has been fixed. If we switch it off and on again, you can see that this side is now working as expected. So there are a few more things to do. Um, so we are going to overrun a little bit, um, but let me add these two. I hope you don't mind. Apologies for that. Um, I'm going to add this as well to our hide layer. And so now it's gone in the attributes manager. Well, maybe let's make this, uh, let's undo this, so to speak, and let's also make it invisible in the viewport. Perfect. So there are a few more things that we need to do here in the in the rig. First of all, let me show that uh, it's still working, but we have to get rid of that offset here. And the way that we can do this, well, what I want to do from now on is um, to make this rig a little bit more flexible. So first of all, if we go to roof floors and ground floor, there is a parameter here in transform that is position Z or Z. And we can use this to move those clones here in and out. And if we set this to 20 centimeters, 20, not 200, you can see that it's exactly matching here. So let me create another parameter here on my, um, on my user data tag, which is our wall offset. And I'm gonna leave the data type at float. I'm gonna adjust the interface to be a float slider. The unit is supposed to be a length unit, so centimeters or so. And I'm going to restrict the slider max to, let's go with 100. And the default value at zero, that's okay. And now the next thing I'm gonna add is a separator. So let me adjust the data type to separator. I'm gonna delete the name and just um, tick separator line. And then I'm gonna place it here. And now when I click okay, you can see that we have a separator line and we've got this wall offset parameter. And now we need to link that up in our Expresso. So let me double click the Expresso tag. And in here, I'm just going to create, well, a new instance of this house controls uh, thing and add the wall offset. And now I'm going to drag and drop these three objects here. 
And what we need is the position Z. So let me add this as an input for all of these guys. And then we're just going to link it up. So let's drag the wires here. That's perfect. Now let's move this aside and let's have a look if it works. Here we go. Now we have a wall offset slider and we're going to set this to 20. Cool. So that's great already. Now let me also add a functionality that makes this rig a little bit more flexible because what I told you in the beginning is that every single one of these wall elements is exactly 100 by 100 centimeters. But maybe we don't need them or we want some of them or all of them not to be square but somehow different like 300 by 200 and so on and this means that we somehow we need an option to adjust this so that we are not restricted to 100 by 100 um, centimeters when it comes to those wall elements so what i'm going to do is um here again in the user data tag i'm going to add some user data so add data and the first one is going to be um, my segment width and again i'm going to set this to be a float slider with the length unit and slider max can now be yeah i think 500 centimeters is good and we're gonna add a zero here and our default value is going to be 100 centimeters and then i'm going to create a copy of this one and this is going to be my segment height cool let's add this here and let's create a copy of the separator and hit okay and now we've got these two parameters as well that's great we're starting to get more flexible. Now let's add these parameters here to the Expresso, to the output side of this node. And now we have segment width and segment height as well. So where are we going to plug these two? Now, in the beginning, we created these multipliers to multiply the count of segments with 100, because 100 centimeters used to be like our, um, height and width of one wall element. But because we want this to be more flexible, we want to pipe the segment width into the multiplier for X and for Z or Z. And the multiplier for the height goes into the, mul uh, yeah, the segment height goes into the multiplier of size Y. And what we can do now, is here we can adjust the height and width of the segments and now we are completely flexible and can also use wall elements that have a different size than 100 by 100 centimeters so that's also a cool thing great is there anything else i want to add let me see if i go down here actually yeah that's that's a bad behavior actually what i want to do is those segments here are supposed to be like the floors including the ground floor so what i want to do is i want to add one in the espresso so that this here is a segment count of two and um so on so let me do this by going into the espresso and what i'm going to do is i'm gonna create a copy of that multiply here and i'm gonna set a function to add and i'm gonna add one and now with this one here i'm gonna pipe my segments y in here and then i'm gonna plug that into segments y on the cube so that did something and now i also have to pipe that into 
this guy here that is multiplying our segments y with our segments height. So now if I go down to two, you can see that we've got two floors, including the ground floor. So that's cool. I'm happy with that. And the next thing I want to do is I want to create a roof. And that's then also the last thing I'm going to do, but it will take another 10 minutes. So let me create a plane. And this plane, let's just leave the size as is and let's reduce the count of segments to one by one. Now, first of all, let me bring this to the correct uh, position in Y direction. This seems to be easy and it also is, but um, we need to consider one more thing here. So just um, rename this to roof, place it in here and let's create an Espresso node for it. And we are also going to add an input for position Y. And now, in theory, what we need to do is just to pipe the, the result of this um, Y multiplier into this here. But now you can see, oh no, it's one floor too much. So what we actually need is like one version of the size y that um, doesn't have the add and one that has the add. So I'm going to create a copy here and I'm going to throw this guy in and use the segment height as well. And then I'm going to throw this into the position y. And now it's the right height and I can adjust the segments y however I want. And um, yeah, it's in the right spot. However, maybe we want some parameter that is capable of um, adjusting the height a little bit to fine tune it, like to add, let's say 20 centimeters to, um, to the height. So let me create another user data, or let me just create a copy of the wall offset and rename it to roof offset. Just hit OK, and here we are. We're going to add this roof offset to this guy as an output. And I'm going to add it here on top. Right, this roof offset has to be added to this one. So let's copy the add and move it down here, and we're going to use this as input one, this as input two. So we're gonna add the roof offset to the output of this one and then plug this into the roof. Let's double check this. Perfect. So let's set this to 20 as well. So this is looking good. And now we need to adjust the size here, which is, well, in the roof, it is the width and the height. So let's add the two as inputs. And now let's see what we can do. All right. So we can plug the, the X size in here and the Z size in here. This would like almost get us there, but you can see that there is a gap. And this is because we added this wall offset here that is set to 20 centimeters. And we need to add the 20 centimeters on each side as well. So we need to add it here and here, and then for the other, um, for the other um, side here and here. Great, so what do we need to do? We need to multiply this wall offset by two and then add it to these wires here to the width and to the height. So let me create a multiplier by just copying it. Let's set input two to two and let's um, connect the wall offset with input one. 
Right, so we are halfway there. Now we need to add this. And I'm going to, wait, let's push that down here and create two copies. The first one is this one, which needs to go in here. And then this one needs to go in here. And the multiplier needs to go in here. And then we need to connect the two. That was the short version of setting this up. And as you can see, it's working. Let me show this again and double check it. That's looking perfect. Great. So I'm really happy that this is working. We are almost there. Let me create a real roof here with a with a like with a, a triangle um, triangle roof, something I don't know what it's called in English, but I guess you know what I mean. So what I'm going to add here um, is another geometry modifier, and this is going to be the polygon bevel, and I'm going to place it here. And you can already see that it's doing something. Maybe let me throw away the font tag. And you can see, okay, that's that's cool. And we are going to adjust the inset to 100% and bring up the offset to something like this. And now we even have a roof that is adjusting, like so. So this is also cool. And now there is really one last thing that I want to show you, and then um, I promise you that I let you go, um, which is because we were setting this up as a MoGraph setup, we can now control which of these elements um, is going to appear where um, by creating an effector and field setup. And this is a quite powerful one because um, it makes stuff so much more flexible. So let's go to um, the floors. These are the windows, closed and open. And we can set the clones parameter here from iterate to um, either random, or we can also set it to blend. And by setting it to blend, we can now blend between the open and the closed, um, uh, the closed version of it. And this can be done by creating a plane effector. And instead of setting it to adjust the position, we can um, crank up modify clone. And now you can already see if we are adjusting the strength here, we can open and close these windows. And now the good thing is that we can use fields and let's say we are going to add some randomness so let's add a random field and now some of these windows are a little bit more closed and others are a little bit more open and if i want to adjust this a little bit more we can go down in the remapping tab of the random field and set the contour mode to curve and then in here let's just adjust the spline type or the spline preset to linear and now we can open all of them up, but some of them can be like half open or so. So this is something that is cool. And the other thing that is also cool is um, that I can also define, for example, where a door should be. Um, so let me show this as well. Um, if I get rid of the random effector and um, let me also add another box field here. So let's create a box field and we are going to adjust the, the dimensions here, let's say to 1000 by 1000 and X is supposed to be 100. And now it's going this direction, which is okay. And I want to um bring the inner offset of the remapping to 100 percent and now let me see 
something is not working. It's not connected here. Oh yes, it is. Let me let, oh yeah, it worked already. It worked already. So here we go. If we now move this box field around, well, it's it's just too big. That's why I was a little bit confused. Let's make this 50 centimeters. And now you can see that in the windows, we can already define which column is going to be open and which one is closed. And the same thing can be done down here. So let me go to the ground floor cloner. And if we set the clones mode to blend or sort here, we can do the very same thing in theory. So let's set it to and sort. Yeah, I know why, because the effector is not assigned here. So let me assign the plane effector here as well. And now you can see that we have this door here and we can move everything around. And well, this way we could define rows of balconies or um, like define that this is the staircase. Normally this, or sometimes those staircase windows are a little bit different or offset. And yeah, this is a pretty flexible setup that you can that you can create within like, yeah, now it took me a little bit more than an hour, but um, it's a quite powerful one. So that's that's the end of what I wanted to show and I hope you liked it. That was really, really cool. <laughs> really, really interesting. And Mind yeah, you can do so many Easy. things with that. You can <laughs> animate, yeah. Yeah, exactly. You can you can create like motion graphics houses that react to your animation in fields and so on. So it's pretty cool. I would love to use your audio effector or audio field uh, to make the, the window open uh, with yeah. the music. So yeah, many that's, things that's possible. That. That's possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Definitely. Well, that's a great stuff. That, yeah. um, so you can play around with it. So yeah, that's... you can use your imaginations to test the limit, right? Yeah, exactly. Right. That's what I'm... I love about 3D. I mean, the... yeah, your own imagination is, is, is your limit. So we do. Yeah. Yeah, we do what we want. We do what we want. You just have to know your tools. That's it. There were several people anxious to see the roof. <laughs> yeah. But at the tutorial, there was no roof. It was very strange. But now we have yeah. a beautiful roof. Yeah. Well, a lot Great. of people liking it. Bernard, cool. say kudos to you, Jonas. Very cool. Thank you. Thanks a lot. A lot of, a lot of good comments. Seems like people are loving it. Thank you so much for providing the information. And yeah, um, should I wrap up? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Are you going to yeah. grab the screen back, or do you want me to throw it at you? No, I'll I'll grab it. Perfect. It's safer. Oh yeah. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today. Um, such a great session. If you agree with me, Jonas is really meticulous with the detail. That's really cool. Thank you so much, Jonas. And um, Welcome. if if you are like me, you probably want to watch it. You want to rewatch it, you know, <laughs> to to um, to let it sink. And to do so, um, you can just um, carefully, um, how do you call it, watch our YouTube channel because uh, we'll upload it shortly after the recording is available. Probably the safe measurement will be yeah tomorrow. Tomorrow it, it should be in in YouTube already. And um, yeah, I heard, I saw in chat that there there are plenty of people that having an issue with a T-shirt link. I'm really sorry about the issue. I had a talk with a with a web team, and it seems like um, seems like the code is working. So um, uh, just to make sure, um, if you have used the code in the previous sessions, um, then uh, yeah, the code meant to be only for one order. But if you uh, haven't used the code in the previous um, sessions, but then you still have the issues, please uh, write us to training at maxon.net so that we can um, escalate the issue to the web team. I'm really sorry if that is the case. You can, you you can also try, that, that worked for me, um, to, um, to delete the browser cache. 
or that and then yes. revisit uh, the site that uh, helped on my end so yeah here's that's so, this tip maybe before you write exactly Pre uh, yeah. probably try to delete your browser cache as well and retry the link and code and if the problem persists and you haven't you haven't ordered before uh, you haven't used the code before then write us an email please let us know all right and um on that note yeah just to remind you if you want to take uh, certifications or to test your cinema 4d knowledge simply go to maxon.net slash certifications and we have plenty different uh, elementary knowledge tests and then also two meticulous uh, cinema 4d uh, certifications and for next sessions please feel free to join us in the next demystifying post-production sessions with me and Lionel and also Noseman, Thanasis, and, and we'll, we'll be talking a lot more about color and uh, 3D apps, the Cinema 4D and Redshift, and then also how you can set um, color management framework, especially ACES inside Cinema 4D using Redshift. And then we'll also see some uh, compositions that Lionel will walk us through, will, will walk us through in um, After Effects. And in the third sessions, I think I'll be joining in and letting uh, shed some light in um, setting up ACES and showing us, showing you a different uh, workflow in ACES in DaVinci Resolve when you want to grade your footage. We'll try to uh, cover all that in short five uh, sessions. And then at the last sessions, I think jo uh, Diego will join us to cover more about the monitoring side. And yeah, thank you so much for uh, showing up today. It's been a great pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Jonas. Thank you, Lionel. Thank you. Wish you all a nice evening and good day to everyone on the other side of the world, of course. And yeah, until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, and take care. Goodbye, Bye. everyone. Thanks for watching. Bye, everyone.